Okay, so our next speaker is a professor in NTU's Lee Kong Shan School of Medicine. He is also a tenured professor at the psychiatry section of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, it, he spent most of his scientific career in Sweden, and he was educated also in Hungary, Belgium, and Oxford, where he studied several fields including medicine, physics, philosophy, and neuroscience. He has made fundamental contributions to the field of functional brain mapping using positron emission tomography. During the past years, his research focus has been on molecular neuroimaging using PET, and he focuses on neurological and psychiatric diseases for which he tries to develop novel diagnostic and thera therapeutic approaches. Across his scientific career, he has published nine books, written over 35 book chapters, and contributed to over 190 research papers. He, he is a member of various scientific academic institu institutions, which includes the Academia Europea, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and the Royal Belgian Academy of Medical Sciences. He's al um, he is also a founder of the World Science Forum, but apart from all this, um, he is also, this Hungarian neurobiologist is also a father of three, and sometimes he also enjoys listening to opera. And in his talk today, we would see how his knowledge and love for the arts, philosophy, and science has enabled him to ponder about one of the most complex systems that we now know, which is the human brain. So let us now welcome Professor Balash Goyash. So dear friends, first of all, allow me to express my uh, sincere thanks to my friend Jan Fassbinder, who invited me on a short notice to this uh, symposium, because uh, apart from being uh, one of the members of the new medical school, and our dean, Professor James Best, is here, and we have to uh, do an impossible task, not impossible, but a very challenging task to set up a new medical school. In the bottom of my heart, I am a kind of a uh, interdisciplinary person who is very much interested in this exact field, in this very field, what is the topic, the main topic of this symposium, this workshop, emergentism. And uh, in this regard, what I would like to talk, talk about is basically on this picture, or more precisely, this is what I would like to talk about. Emergence. Emergence of something which was already there, but you didn't really realize it. And suddenly it emerges. Or is it really so? Well, in this case, we had a little perceptual trick. The figure was already there. And then it emerged because it emerged in our brain due to a psychophysical event. However, real emergence in nature is not that big deal. It comes with time. So basically what we will talk about is not exactly this. It is something different. In this lecture, I would like to talk about the basic foundations of emergent evolutionism, which is a major philosophical school. And in the 20th century, this was one of those major uh, uh, philosophical schools which flourished especially in the first half of the century. Then I would like to compare it with other philosophical approaches. And last but not least, I would like to talk about its relationship with the human brain and the human mind. So despite the fact that we all use the word emergence, we quite often forget about the fact that emergent evolutionism is a major, let's put it this way, philosophical or naturalist school, which, strangely enough, is not traced back to Darwin and Darwinism, but it developed parallel in the last years of the 19th century and in the first half of the 20th century with the development of Darwinian evolution theory. In fact, it can be traced back to another school of thought, the origin of which is basically encoded in the Aristotelian philosophy, the cause-affect relationship and what is then uh, related to this sort of classical causative 
inductive and then deductive reasoning logic. Basically, the foundations of emergentism and emergent evolutionism as a philosophical school can be traced back to David Hume. And David Hume's treatise of human nature from 1739, in which for the first time he describes the modern theorem, the modern idea of causation in nature. Based on David Hume's uh, treatise, the greatest founder of the logician school in analytic philosophy, John Stuart Mill, in his logic in 1843, described and elaborated on the idea of inductive reasoning. And based on his inductive reasoning idea, a few years later, George Henry Lewis, in his Problems of Life and Mind, and then the grand opus of Lewis, the foundations of a creed, the physical basis of mind, and mind as a function of organism, describe in great detail the concept of emergence. Then later on, the whole idea was treated in great depth by a series of philosophers, and especially in the beginning of the 20th century. People like Samuel Alexander, and especially Lloyd Morgan, developed the idea into a flourishing philosophical school of ideas. And of course, some other major philosophers, such as Whitehead, contributed significantly to the de further development of emergent evolutionism, but also the idea got impetus from biologists, especially entomologists, strangely enough. Entomologists, such as William Wheeler, a Harvard professor, whose great book on ant society is one of the major biological impetus behind this idea. And strangely enough, as I expressed earlier, Darwinian evolution theory did not directly contribute to emergent evolutionism as a philosophical thought, as a philosophical school. Later on, in later years of the century, great philosophers such as Karl Popper, Karl, Karl Popper or Mario Bunge made significant contributions to further development of the theory. So just these few words, of course, about the philosophical background, the history of the school. But of course, there are many more, dozens, dozens of more philosophers who contributed to the whole idea, which was especially, uh, this whole sort of development was especially burgeoning in the first half of the 20th century. So what are the basic concepts of emergent evolutionism as a philosophical school, as a philosophical uh, process, in a way? The most important idea is the notion of level. Emergent evolutionists claim that there are levels in nature. And these levels can be defined there are, of course, a large number of different definitions, but they primarily converge on one thing, namely that a level is an independent entity. Well, there is a big issue here, whether it is an ontological entity or an epistemological entity. Or last but not least, a logical entity in the strictest word of the sense of logic in philosophical sense. Well, an original uh, idea later summarized by uh, Goethe was a level is a defined portion of the word that is marked by a set of closely related characteristics peculiar to it and emergent from other levels that existed previously. Of course, there are a number of other definitions such as a group of entities that are exemplars of the same set of specific laws. Or a level is a class of structures or processes which are distinguishable from others as being either higher or lower. And Bunge's sort of more uh, philosophical and in a way loser definition, grades in a static scale or stages in a process. And finally, yet another more recent definition 
by Wimset a local maximum of predictability and regularity in nature. So, as you say, there is a common agreement among philosophers and, of course, natural scientists that there are levels in nature, and we can treat these levels. We can discuss the existence, the laws, the rules of these different levels as both philosophers and naturalists. Of course, as I am already mentioned, the question, it's not clear at all, and strangely enough, emergent evolutionists don't deal with this issue in detail, whether these levels are ontological levels, epistemological, or logical levels, according to the different philosophical uh, mainstream uh, schools in philosophy. The second major concept in emergent evolutionism is hierarchy. There is a hierarchy of levels in nature, and this hierarchy is a kind of a clear evolutionary hierarchy. So it comes with time as nature unfolds itself, as the universe unfolds itself. In the original publication, and this was a uh, lecture series at Glasgow in the 1917s by Samuel Alexander, he referred to an interesting six-graded universal hierarchy, space-time, primary qualities, matter, secondary qualities, life, mind, and deity. Following the lead of Alexander, the most important figure in the early 20th century of emergent evolutionism, Lloyd Morgan, reduced it to four levels, matter, life, mind, and deity. Then, of course, a major contribution in the late 1950s by Hilary Putnam and Paul Oppenheimer from Stanford University came by their famous, very, very famous pu uh, publication, Unity of Science as a Working Hypothesis, and in this monumental volume, they fully accept the emergentist idea, and they refer basically to the following levels, elementary particles, atoms, molecules, cells, multicellular organisms, and social groups. And last but not least, from another angle, the philosopher Karl Popper described in his book, Together with John Ackless, The Self and Its Brain, basically the three-word idea, basically Popper already defined his three-word idea in other publications, but he detailedly described in this book with Eccles, claiming that the first word, the word of physical object, consists of at least three levels, hydrogen and helium, heavy elements, and living organisms. The second word of Popper, the word of subject subjective experience, consists of two levels, sentience, or animal consciousness, and here I refer to Atsushi's lecture, and consciousness of self and of death as the next level. And last but not least, at the level of word three, the product of the human mind, there are again at least two levels, the human language level, theories of self and of death, and the work of arts and the work of science. So this is again a very interesting contribution to the idea of levels and shows the versatility of the whole philosophical concept of emergent evolutionism. The third most important concept is emergence. What is emergence? The key issue in, emer in emergent evolutionism. As in the original definition by Samuel Alexander, it is stated, the emergence of a new quality from any level of existence means that at all level, there comes into being a certain constellation or collocation of the motions belonging to that level and possessing the quality appropriate to it. And this collocation possesses a new quality distinctive of the higher complex. The higher quality emerges from the lower level of existence and has its roots therein, but it emerges therefrom and it does not belong to that lower level but constitutes its possessor a new order of existence with its special laws of behavior. And this is the most classical notion of emergence. Or later on, 
as Samuel Pepper wrote in his book on emergence, there are three kinds of changes. Chance occurrence, gradual shift, and emergence. And emergence is a certain characteristic that supersede other characteristics. And these characteristics are adequate to explain the occurrence of their level. But emergence are not laws, but what the laws describe. And indeed, this is a key notion, and we can, of course, enter a long discussion into this whole conundrum. What are the attributes, according to emergent evolutionists, of emergence? Well, the most important attribute is unpredictability. That the antecedent phases of an emergent evolution do not permit of the prediction of the sub subsequent phases is axiomatic. And this is a major, major idea here. You cannot predict based on your knowledge of all nodes of a certain level, like the physical level or the chemical level, the emergence of the biological level according to the theory. A being who knew only mechanical or chemical action could not predict life. He must wait till life emerged with the course of time. And this is a major, major, major tenet of evolutionism, uh, emergent evolutionism. The second at least as important attribute of emergence is novelty. To say that the emergent characteristic is novel means that it is not simply a rearrangement of pre-existing elements, although such a rearrangement may be one of its determining conditions. The characteristic is qualitatively unlike anything that existed before in cosmic history, and it was unpredictable not only on the basis of the knowledge available prior to its emergence, but even on the basis of ideally complete knowledge of the state of the cosmos prior to its emergence. And this is a fundamental tenet here, that based on all knowledge about, say, elementary particles, we'll not be able to predict, for instance, the existence or emergence of life or consciousness. And this, in a way, is a clear opposition to, in clear opposition to, for instance, Mathesis Universalis, which René Descartes claimed in his famous discourse on philosophy, that based on certain starting conditions and knowledge of all physical laws or natural laws, you would be able to predict the next, next, and yet next stages of the development of the universe. No, according to emergentism, you will never be able to make such predictions. And last but not least, and this is a crucial issue again, what makes emergence emerge? And this is, of course, a very deeply philosophical issue. And strangely enough, you would believe that all emergentists were sort of pious people, religious people, who resorted to an external source as a driving force, a prime mover behind all these developments. No. Basically, emergent, emergent evolutionists never resorted and do not resort to an external source. Let it be a prime mover, a first cause of Aristotle, God, Alan, or something outside the universe. However, they claim there are internal sources, and in this regard, they can even incorporate God as an internal source inside a system, like in the original book by Samuel Alexander, God is an internal source as a part of the hierarchically organized universe. Nisus, he calls the driving force as Nisus, is the cosmic impetus, which is the causally effective influence of God at every stage of the progressive advance. And a few years later, Lloyd Morgan, the second major figure in the early development of emergent evolutionism, identifies Alexander's Nisus with Spinoza's Conatus. And in my friend, we discussed with Jan a couple of weeks ago, it's a very interesting notion because Spinoza appears to me in this respect as the first emergent evolutionism, at least in this regard. Now, of course, the majority of emergent evolutionism 
claim other internal sources in nature, like Aldous Huxley, younger brother of Julian Huxley, to which Atsushi referred to in his lecture regarding the Darwinian evolutionary idea of Julian Huxley. Aldous Huxley claims that the idea of epigenesis is an internal, inherent idea in nature, and it's behind the development in nature. This is the internal source, internal impetus for progress. Later on, of course, there were other philosophers who claimed different solutions to, this in, to name this internal impetus by different names. And in this regard, I can claim only that there are, more recently, several physicists like Hawking who claim that there are natural laws which are behind this impetus. And I will show one example by Ilya Prigozhin, the Nobel Prize winner physicist, shows that selective systems together with symmetry breakings and thermodynamic laws can basically explain this impetus behind the development in nature. Of course, the original idea, the original school of emergent evolutionism got quite some criticism from different angles of course, the basic criticism is that since emergentists don't deal with the philosophical questions, whether these levels and the hierarchy is indeed an ontological hierarchy in nature, in the cosmos, or just an epistemological. That is to say, we see it as human beings, as scientists, as philosophers, because due to our approach, let it be a Kantian view, or let it be just an analytic view, we try to identify levels in nature, or these levels indeed are ontological entities, evolutionary, emergent evolutionists. They don't deal with these questions. Uh, other criticis, uh, criticisms say it's a form of epiphenomenalism, and we will deal it later on, or it is only a semantic issue, and it's representing the boundaries of our semantic analysis. And of course, a major criticism, and I like it very much, is that what is novelty for us is probably not novelty for nature. And we should regard nature as such, and it's only our human anthropomorphic view which sees these emergencies in nature due to our limited perspectives. And of course, there are criticism for other angles. For instance, some claim it completely lacks explanatory power, or, and this is the major, major criticism by many who refer to Descartes, there cannot be more in the affect than there is in the cause. That is to say, emergent properties cannot supersede the properties of the lower level, and there cannot be laws which are emerging from laws of the lower levels. And last but not least, there is a very funny criticism from a Nobel Prize physicist, Max Delbruck, who was very much emergentist in his mind and his writings. He was an adamant protagonist of the idea, but he still criticized it, claiming that emergentism camouflages the real problems of evolution behind an appealing metaphor, despite the fact that he was one of the greatest physicists who were fully standing behind the whole idea. And of course, from within, there is again a very strange criticism coming recently, and especially Mario Bunge, the Canadian, Argentinian-born Canadian philosopher, claimed unpredictability is a dogma which cannot be touched upon, so we should break this dogma, this taboo, and try to explain unpredictability by analyzing it, by sort of having a scientific approach. And I will try to give you a few ideas about how to break this unpredictability dogma with natural scientist approaches. Now take a break after this short introduction and ask a few questions as a natural scientist or a social scientist, so as a scientist. Are there indeed hierarchical levels in nature? Are there evolutionary changes in nature? And 
is there a connection between evolutionary changes, emergence, and hierarchical levels in nature? And I think it's almost all evident. We all believe in hierarchical levels in nature. We all believe in evolutionary changes in nature. And if it is so, we must believe in some connection between these changes, emergence, and levels. Well, in fact, our recent picture about the unfolding universe is something like that. Following the Big Bang, there is a huge development in the history of the cosmos. There are certain light, dark, and light periods. Matter evolves from dark energy. And from matter, galaxies, stars are formed. And then there is, after the galaxy formation period, solar system formation period. And the solar systems, actually, we know of one such solar system. Our solar system may give rise to planets, which can give rise to life, which develops further on. And we have heard a beautiful lecture by Atsushi about some aspects of the biological evolution. So nobody really doubts about the existence of evolution in nature. And based on this sort of scheme or common perception of this whole process, nobody questions that there are levels, certain levels of complexity in nature. But the real question is, the third question, is there a connection between evolutionary changes, hierarchic levels, and emergence in nature? And this is a really important philosophical question from many points of view. Well, since modern natural science appeared since William Ockham and Roger Bacon, there were basically two major impetus regarding this issue, regarding this conundrum, from two major philosophical schools or waves of schools in the history of philosophy. One comes from Aristotle, who introduced the idea of deductive reasoning. There are premises, and based on these premises, we can draw a conclusion. And deductive reasoning has been one of the major promoters of modern science, the idea of modern scientific inquiry. The other major impetus came from Descartes, who said, Mathesis universalis, that is to say, nature can be analyzed using a mathematical way. We can extend our mathematical inquiry, deductive reasoning, to each and every detail of natural processes, and we can use a kind of a general mathesis to explain cause and effect relationships, causal relationships in nature, and basically nature can be analyzed by this way. How to achieve these sort of um, general deductive laws? Well, and here comes a very interesting remark by Einstein. The supreme task is to arrive at those universal elementary laws from which the cosmos can be built up by pure deduction, and so far so good. This is, and this was, and still is the general tenet of natural sciences, and natural science inquiries. However, there is a very interesting second sentence here by Einstein. There is no logical path to these laws, only intuition, resting on sympathetic understanding of experience, can reach them. And this gives rise to an interesting let's put it this way, hesitation. However, based on all these things, it is clear that nobody doubts, nobody has ever doubted in, natural science, in the history of natural sciences, there must be a connection between the hierarchical levels, a change, and emergence. So the answer to the third question is, again, a yes. However, and I fully sympathize with Einstein's Remark. The way how we get to these deductive laws is not clear at all. 
Now, coming back to this issue, if we all agree that there is an evolution development in our universe and this development brings about certain levels, levels of matter, energy, matter, galaxies, formation of stars, planetary systems, living beings, we all agree upon all these different aspects. And this has been described by several books, several important contributions in recent years to natural sciences, claiming that this cosmic evolution results later on in molecular evolution and then organic evolution resulting in biological evolution and followed by human evolution and so on and so on and so on. So there are interactions in the evolving or unfolding universe and these interactions can build up certain levels among the interactive parties and these levels can then go up to these higher and higher levels in the hierarchy of existence in the universe. And nobody, nobody really doubts this sort of approach, although there are different sort of scientific approaches to explain what are the levels in nature. However, the real philosophical question, and let me come back to this issue, is whether these levels evolve from each other and what are the laws behind the evolvements or emergence of the new levels from the lower levels. So if we regard this evolutionary hierarchy between the different levels, we have to realize there are interfaces between the different levels and this is a common issue in this whole philosophical conundrum. There are interfaces and definitely both the levels and the interfaces should have certain laws. And we should understand, we as natural scientists, should be able to understand the laws of both the levels and the interfaces in this whole conundrum. And there must be some common laws and specific laws, common which are common to all levels, like basic physical laws, gravity, and so on, and so on, and so on. And there are, of course, and this is a common, uh, common sense, specific laws which are only valid at this given level. And the same is valid for the interfaces. If you would like to decipher these evolutionary interfaces in the history of the universe, we must resort to certain common and certain specific laws. And this is the really interesting and intriguing issue in the history of emergent evolutionism and its impact on natural sciences. What kind of laws can explain the behavior at the interface level, at the different interface levels? And now I just give you one possible interpretation that by Ilya Prigozhin, the Nobel Prize winner physicist, who in his book, From Being to Becoming, he sets out a very interesting idea a physical theory. He claims that certain laws, and these are the conservation laws in nature, show very clear symmetry and they are thereby guaranteeing invariance in nature. Whereas based on asymmetry, and we all know in physics asymmetry is a major, major, major thing. Certain laws are so-called transformation laws and they are responsible for variancy in nature. And his idea, when put into, I would say, a, a theory of the dynamics of large-scale systems indicated that this broken symmetry in nature and thereby the laws of transformation are responsible for causality. Because there is broken symmetry, there is a distinction between past and future in the history of the universe, in physics. And this results in causality. And this causality, this irreversibility, leads to a kind of an irre irreversible ongoing process in the history of the universe, which is, of course, witnessed by entropy. And this irreversibility re uh, results in dissipative structures. 
So Prigozhin, as you may know, was the father of dissipative structures. And in this regard, he thought, or even he had a very clear idea that these dissipative structures can give rise to evolving structures, such as biological structures. Regarding biological structures as dissipative structures, they have an instability through fluctuations which increases their dissipatory behavior, that is to say increases their entropy, and they can reach certain thresholds where, strangely enough, these dissipations can result in a reverse thermodynamic process, decreasing entropy and thereby building up biological systems. Flow of matter and energy can build up functions and structures in his world, in his physical world, and this can result in a loop, an evolutionary feedback loop, which according to Ilya Prigozhin can result in evolution at different stages in the history of cosmos, with special regard to the evolution of life in the universe. So this is one possible explanation which uh, obtained quite some acclaim uh, 30, 40 years ago when Prigozhin was still alive. Uh, but there are, of course, a number of other similar possible explanations for this hierarchical organization in our universe. Now, I think nobody really doubts that these levels or sort of levels exist in the universe and that there are interactions between the levels. Our real question is now, in the rest of my talk, we'll focus on these interactions at the highest level in this hierarchy. Although I have to claim, and I have to ask a real question, do we really believe that these mutual interactions between the different levels exist already, or also at the highest level? That is to say, can consciousness or cognition interact with our physical, biological brain, and so on, and so on, and so on. So these are the recently asked major questions in the aftermath of the main epoch of emergent evolution. And these questions are mainly raised by neuroscientists nowadays. Now let's focus on the next sort of aspect of this whole conundrum and coming a step closer to our main idea the brain-mind issue, the brain-mind conundrum. Well, in philosophy, this is one of those major philosophical items which have been present in the history of Western philosophy for more than two millennia. The question is simple. Are there two entities, our brain and the mind? And if there are at all, what is the relationship between these two entities? This issue was for the first time clearly stated, formulated by René Descartes. And since then, this has become one of the central issues in philosophy. Well, of course, there are a number of different possible interpretations. Of course, we can go through all these things. It's needless to go through all these ideas. But in idealisms, only the mind exists, and everything is only the mind alone. One of the protagonists of this view was George Berkeley, the bishop in the 17th century, who believed the mind and only the mind is producing the world and what is outside the human uh, being. Of course, there are different other solutions, neutral monism, which claims brain and mind are basically the product of something unknown, an entity which is not known to us. Of course, there are a large number of purely materialistic approaches like eliminative materialism. Only the brain exists, there is no mind. Or more refined forms of material materialism claiming that the mind is a set of physical states or the mind is a set of emergent bioactivities or the mental and the behavior are only semantic duplicities, everything is physical, or the mental is only a subset of physical processes. 
And there are, of course, dualist positions in which there are different versions claiming that the two entities exist parallel and have basically independent life, or they are synchronous as harmonious, but they are not interrelating or intercon they are not interconnected with each other. Of course, there are epiphenomenalist theories claiming that the mind is just an epiphenomenon, a byproduct of brain activity or animism, in which they claim the mind is clearly acting over our brain and driving our brain in all respects. There are, of course, functionalist ideas, interactionist ideas, and last but not least, emergent evolutionist approaches, which is basically the result of the philosophical school of emergent evolutionism, and it claims that both the mind and the brain are existing entities. The mind is basically an emergent entity based on the brain's activity, and it can interact with its brain. So basically, this position, this philosophical position claims that there are hierarchical entities at this level of the development in our universe as well, and the mind is basically the next level based on the brain's activity. Now again, let's take a step backward and ask again what a neuroscientist like me, infected by philosophy, should ask at this point. If it is so, the real question is, can we, neuroscientists, understand the human brain and consequently the human right? And I have to claim there are very clear obstacles ahead of us in this regard. Very clear and very severe obstacles. So if we want to explore this whole conundrum, first of all, we have to deal with a few major issues, major challenges in the field. I don't want to enlist all the major challenges. Let me just show you a few examples of these possible challenges ahead of us. A major mathematical challenge is formulated by Kurt Gödel in the 1930s, and in his incompleteness theorem, or theorems in more precisely, Gödel claimed that basically, and now I use an interpretation of the Gödel theorem, transformed by Tarski at Harvard for linguistic theory, claiming that a semantically closed system will never be able to explain itself fully and completely due to, and there is a long mathematical proof of its nature. I, please don't read it. I once in my life spent a few weeks on reading Kurt Gödel's original paper. It's a very heavy mathematics, but basically, the theorem resulted in several different consecutive theorems like Tarski's theory regarding semantic systems and languages, or Benatzereff applied it to the human brain. And all in all, they claim that there is a major obstacle here, which results, if we go through all the proofs, that the human brain cannot explain itself because it's a closed semantic system, and we need to resort to other systems to, to be able to understand how our system, which would like to explain itself, is functioning. So this is a major, major obstacle. And of course, we can talk weeks about the Gödel, Gödel theorem. There is also a philosophical issue here, a major philosophical issue, which basically was already present in Aristoteles' works but it was more clearly defined later on, the nature of subjective experience. And in this relation, the conundrum of the qualia. What is a qualia? Now, I start this story not with Aristotle, but with Erwin Schrödinger, who claimed the sensation of color cannot be accounted for by the physicist's objective picture of light waves. Could the physiologist account for it? if he had fuller knowledge than he has of the processes in the retina and in the nervous processes set up by them in the optical nerve bundles and in the brain? I don't think so. And this is a major issue if you deal with subjective experience, that is to say, the 
content of your mind or of your brain activity. And the distinctive feature here is subjectivity. Your subjective experience is only yours. And even if you try to describe it by language or by other means to your neighbors, to your fellows, to your wife, and so on, it's still your subjective experience, which is, which is not easy for any accession from, out, from the outside world, or to any accession from the outside world. So basically, this qualia issue was formulated by Thomas Nagel in 1957 in his book, in his major essay, What It Is Like to Be a Bat, in which he very clearly formulated the major tenet in the field, consciousness as essential to it, a subjective character, a what it is like aspect, which can hardly be shared with others. And this is the heart issue, the heart conundrum of the whole brain-mind discussion. And as Daniel Dennett, in his famous book, Consciousness Explained, formulated it more clearly, qualia, that is to say, this subjective experience, is an unfamiliar term for something that could not be more familiar to each of us. The ways things seem to us, qualia are ineffable, intrinsic, private, and directly apprehensible in consciousness. And this issue is a second major obstacle. Human conscious experience cannot be explained in objective terms. Now, coming to a third point, a third challenge. The challenges of big data science among them, the Borges map. If we try to explain the human brain, we have to decipher its function, its structure, all its internal connections, all the action potentials, and so on, and so on, and so on. But can big science and big data science approaches, like the Blue Gene, the Blue Brain Program, or the Human Brain Program, or there are a number of other initiatives, help us with this understanding or with this approach? Well, in a way, here comes again a philosophical conundrum which has recently been named after Jorge Borges, the Argentinian writer, who in his beautiful essay on a emperor who asked his cartographers to make a perfect map of his country, reaches the following conclusion. The cartographers tried to satisfy the king, and he tried to make a beautiful map. But the map was too small to describe all details of the country. So they made a bigger map, and then a bigger map, and a bigger map, and finally they ended up in a map which covered the whole country. And basically, each and every point in the map was correlating with the exact, very physical thing in the country. So this is the Borges map. And the problem is here with the Borges map is that big science aims at it. However, misses a point here. A perfect map of the human brain is not the human brain. And it cannot explain its functions. So we need models. We need hypotheses to explain it. And we should not just map it. And this is, I think, the theoretical problem with all these big data approaches like the Blue Brain Project, the Human Brain Project, and sorry to say that the Allen Institute's Brain Project, Brain uh, Map Project, without appropriate models, theories, or insight approaches, we will never be able to use big data in a proper way. And last but not least, a final challenge. All brain-mind theories, or modern brain theory, should be able to cope with this issue, which I already mentioned earlier, the issue of downward causation. How comes that certain things like the human mind, the activity of the human mind, can influence our behavior. If you see a stoplight or a stop sign, you stop your car. So there is a physical action. You press the lever, the brake, and your car stops. Although there was a very clear sort of nonsense little sign there. So how come that symbols, for instance, 
can act upon our physiological, physical entity and make affects. So this issue was for the first time formulated crystal clearly by the Nobel Prize winner Roger Sperry, famous for his split brain experiments, in 1957, when he asked about the causative efficacy of the human brain. Later on, so this issue is whether, of course, consciousness, cognition, can really act upon the physical entity uh, below it, say, the brain. Later on, the whole theory was formulated more clearly by Donald Campbell in his famous book, uh, Levels of Organization and Downward Causation. And then, of course, there was a huge discussion in the famous book, The Self and Its Brain, by Popper and Eccles, about downward causation. And lately, my former mentor and spiritual leader or mental leader, Janusz Santagotai, the brain scientist, formulated it most clearly in his famous essay, Downward Causation in 1984. So the major issue is, how can mental states act upon physical states? And any new brain theory should be able to answer this question. Now, I think my time is just all over, but let me ask five more minutes or four more minutes from you. Of course, I don't want to criticize all these things. I jump it over. The major issue is here whether we can, we neuroscientists can find some neural correlates of higher activities. And if we can find them, we can probably build up brain theories. So basically, the question of neural correlates is a conundrum, is a core issue in this whole discussion. And it has, again, been formulated for the first time by none else than René Descartes, who is in his discourse on philosophy, he described all these relationships between, for instance, pain and its mental qualia, qualia. Also, visual system explained the scene image in the brain appears as a kind of a qualia based on physiological events. And of course, very clear interpretations come from neurophysiologists in recent years, like the famous experiment by Torsten Wiesel and uh, David Hubel on the cortical visual self of cats seeing, for instance, a dark bar, moving dark bar, and they can react accordingly with spike trains. And this can be described as a neural correlate of perceptual events in the brain. And if perceptual events can be described, hopefully perception can be described. And there are also neural correlates of mental states, even thinking, and even mental or conscious states or consciousness. And a few years ago, myself together with others tried to focus on this issue and collected a huge book about all these possible theories on neural correlates of thinking. Now, so if this is possible, then probably we can build up theories of the human brain which can give answer about mental states and about the, what we call the mind. And of course, indeed, there are a large number of recent theories about the neural correlates of the mind. And I cannot explain all of these theories. I will definitely not talk about, for instance, the Crick and Koch theory, which is the most famous theory in the field. I would like to shortly mention a few ideas about how to build up brain theories about higher mental events. And I can call these things uh, alongside some of the key figures of these developments, such as the Moncastle Santagata Edelman line, in which the cortical columnar organization was discovered by Werner Moncastle in the uh, early uh, 70s, based on his earlier discoveries in the 50s, then my mentor Santagata built up, based on this columnar idea, the modular organization of the human brain. Then, of course, John Ackless came into the picture and developed the modular organization based dynamic pattern formation, and then Jerry Edelman, based on all these things, developed his theory of consciousness and mental states in the human brain. So this is one possible interpretation. The human brain consists of modules, columns or modules, which can interact, and pattern formation can be the basis of higher mental functions. Another line is related to another idea, namely, that all those cells in the brain, neurons and other cells, show 
regular activities, electrical activities. They oscillate, and these oscillations can form some patterns and synchronous oscillations in the brain can be the basis of cert certain perceptual formation of patterns, percepts, as well as thoughts, memory traces, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in this regard, von der Malzburg was the first who came up with this idea, and then Wolf Zinger and Jörg Buzsáki further developed, and this is one of the other major trends in modern neuroscience. Yet another idea is based on the so-called uh, spin glass theory, that the work of the brain, of the neurons, is similar to a spin glass in physics, in which all the neurons can interact in a certain way, and they form different layers. There are certain core layers, and there are certain specialized layers, such as the different sensory areas in the brain, tactile, visual, auditory, and so on, and the information elaborated by them enters into the global workspace, where certain reactions can be given based on the information and interactions within the global workspace, and then you can have an appropriate answer to the environment regarding some given questions, and of course it can go up to certain levels. And Jean-Pierre Changeu and his student Stanislas de Haan were the protagonists of this idea, of course based on a Dutch physicist bars in the 50s. And last but not least, and this is my last slide, I think uh, I have to apologize for my best friend, Ursot Marie, couldn't come up due to a flu. 50,000 people in Europe have known the flu. I read it just yesterday in the newspaper. But Ursot Marie would be a speaker of this symposium. Ursh, together with his mentor, John Maynard Smith, is the writer or the author of two major books sold in millions of copies, The Major Transition and Evolution and the Origins of Life. And Ursh and myself a few years ago started to develop an idea but we are progressing very slowly, which we published in these two books. I mean, elements of the idea were published in these two books. And the idea is based basically on the modular organization of the human brain. The human brain shows, and not only the human brain, the monkey brain and so on, shows a columnar modular organization. And these columns, microcolumns, and then macrocolumns, approximately 10 to 30,000 neurons are forming one columnar one modular uh, cortical column, one module, are making networks, cortical circuits, and these cortical circuits, as shown in this example, it is the uh, corpus callosum and the two hemispheres are interacting with each other, and the cortical modular activity forms the cortical operations, the basis of the operations in the cortex. And of course, in the brain, the human or monkey brain, Basic perceptual motor and memory functions of occupy large areas, like here in the precentral gyrus, of course, we have the motor functions, postcentral gyrus, the sensory, uh, somatosensory functions, visual cortex, auditory cortex, but still there are large free areas as the human brain develops, as the monkey brain develops. Atsushi showed very beautifully how these developments go ahead, and these free areas have luxury circuits, or luxury modules, which can be occupied by new functions. And indeed, as this evolution takes place, the evolutionary novel and successful functions, such as speech, language, such as, say, interactions with each other, social skills, music, or other skills, may hijack these luxury circuits. And this is the amoeba hypothesis, which your Satmari formulated couple of years ago, and we, were, we have been working on it. That is to say, all those large areas which are not occupied by basic elementary somatosensory, motor, visual, and so on functions may be hijacked by these new functions, and indeed, language, here is the Broca and the Wernicke area, occupy those still free areas in the human brain, occupy those still luxury circuits or modules in the brain which are not occupied by other basic functions. So I'm so sorry that I took a longer time than needed. And with this, I would like to thank you, your attention, and I hope I could introduce you to this special word of emergent evolutionist and what modern neuroscience does to explain this conundrum. Thank you so much.
professor Gustav. It's a university of technology, so. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Guyash raised some interesting points and more questions about um, emergent evolutionism and the brain-man conundrum. Are there any questions from the audience? Look, it was a, a fascinating talk, and I'm sure I need to think a lot more about it, as we all will. But one, one question came up, and that was the issue of qualia and the problems of understanding what other people experience. Um, can I just suggest that uh, there is, in fact, some evidence of a time series studies of changes in perception with, with injuries to the brain. And Oliver Sacks, who unfortunately is dying of inoperable cancer as we speak, uh, has written a series of books which I found fascinating and which I have to say gave me a better experience of what it is to be human because of the changes in perception, the changes in qualia that occur with changes in the brain. So it's really a comment rather than a question, but I just thought I'd, I'd throw it in. I, I, I greatly appreciate your comment because it shows very clearly that there are clear neural correlates of even the qualia in the same very same person. So in a certain way, we would be able to... And another example, what you mentioned similar to the blind sight, for instance, blind sight. Because blind sight is a kind of a qualia in a way, because you know, in blind sight, you have no cortex, no visual cortex, and you still see. And it's a proven, very famous case. I mean, there are dozens or hundreds of such patients. So it shows that the subjective can be with certain tricks, not tricks, but with proper approaches, somehow be approached, and I fully agree with you. Thank you so much for this comment. Hi, uh, this is a request for a clarification, actually. So I don't think you said this explicitly, but I think I caught a whiff bit of what I thought might, I, I was wondering if you, if you thought that evolution was pro progressed or moved forward, as it were, moved up in levels, I think, to use your language, right? Because I don't think you said this explicitly, but if you do, I thought this was kind of a kind of no-no thing in biology, philosophy of biology, right? It's like, I thought it's something that philosophy of biology, for example, no longer think. I'm thinking of kind of the Stephen Jay Gould kind of like evolution's a bush, not a tree. But I thought we moved away from this idea of kind of hierarchy and movements upwards. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Very good question, uh, because uh, it, it gives me, rise, it gives me a, a possibility to explain something. It's very interesting, actually, that the Darwin evolutionary theory and emergent evolutionists as a theory, as a philosophical theory, went parallel for a long time. So strangely enough, the Darwin evolutionary theory didn't in fact the, this emergent evolutionist philosophical theory. And it's a very interesting why. Because I think in the Darwinian theory, you have very clear preset rules. Of course, not set by Darwin, but the later, like Huxley, I mean, uh, Julian Huxley. Uh, that you need repetitive units which are inheritive, so they have inheriting, they have inheritory uh, properties. There is a, 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 a change, so random mutations, and there is selectivity. So all these three things are essential. And in this regard, it's not really an emergentist theory. So the Darwin evolutionary theory is not emergentist because here, of course, there are shifts, just as you say, a bush of evolution. And this is what you refer to. So in a way, the Darwinian evolution is a smooth progress through, these, through the combination of the three basic elements of the, of the theory. Whereas the philosophical theory of emergentism is not talking about these sort of components. It just registers the, the idea that there are certain I mean, levels and then emergencies in the nature. So it's a very interesting idea what you mentioned. How to combine the two things? Because we talk about evolution, but in a different, using a different vocabulary and different ideas. But I agree, there is time to, to, to look into it. There are, of course, a number of people who try to combine the two things. And recently, quite interesting ideas came out of it. But it, it needs another lecture. There at the back. Thank you for the excellent talk. Um, 
I was, uh, I was interested in, in particular, this idea that the mind, the one of the models of the brain is the Ising model. And there has been some recent evidence that when physicists study these Ising models, then there are some idealized sort of properties, macroscopic properties, such as the magnetization or correlation length, which is formally non-computable from the microscopic elements of the Ising system. So even if you knew the properties of the Ising system completely, you won't be, if you could find these macroscopic properties, you could break the Dalton completeness theorem or the Turing halting problem. And this could lend certain analytical evidence to this sort of idea that um, you, can't for, you can't sort of compute these, uh, the higher level consciousness from the lower level physical model of the brain. So, thank you, it's an excellent idea. I would be most happy to discuss it with you. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I mean, it was not really a question, it was just a comment, yeah, but a comment. I would be so happy to discuss it with yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, I'll send you some references. Great, thank you. Over here. So many of our physiological functions seem to work perfectly fine when we're asleep and mostly not conscious. Um, are there clear neurocorrelates uh, which kind of can be identified with uh, sort of the, the periods when we're uh, conscious and awake versus dreaming versus sleeping and unconscious? Oh, that's an excellent question. And I can, I can give my answer as a practical answer. You probably know that we are setting up here at NTU just a few hundred meters from here, from this building, a magnetoencephalography center, which will be available before the end of this year. This is exactly the question which we will have to investigate in our MEG center in the near future. So if you are volunteering to, to design these experiments and help us with realizing these experiments, uh, you're most welcome. Otherwise, I, th I think there are a number of experiments going on. I know that my friend Jean or our friend Jean-Pierre Changeux went into this field also. I don't know the detailed results, but this is exactly one of those fields which are very heavily explored nowadays, using a special near-infrared spectroscopy during sleep, because we, we cannot use devices which, of course, require from the subject to, to lay in a, in a bed which is very uncomfortable, but near infrared or EEG caps now reach the level that they can be used during sleep. And I know there are a number of groups. Actually, in Kuopio in Finland, there is a very strong group actually focusing exactly on this issue. Nick Oplinski, thank you very much for an excellent lecture. And I was just wondering if you were um, including in your thinking and looking forward the sort of holographic representation explanations which for me from an outside view seem to move beyond the you know subjective versus objective which then you naturally lead to a linear progression to a much more dynamic sort of states and interaction um, and what work has been done in that field because I see very little out there thank you uh, again, uh, thank you for the comment, and I cannot really comment your comment because I think it's an excellent, excellent point. And this is one of the possibilities that we try to objectivize in a way, subjectivity. And definitely, we need to find these little doors into, into this, this realm. I fully agree with you. This is one possible. I don't, I don't know either, but, but I fully agree with you. This must be one of those possibilities which we should explore. We still have time for some questions, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Thio Tiong San from Ministry of Education. Just a comment, um, in the Western world, I just want to start off with the, the statement that we're all familiar with, that uh, the map is not the territory, right? And in the Western world, uh, we, through rationalism and deductive, inductive, the empiricism, uh, we try to construct a model, uh, which is actually a map of the reality of either consciousness or nature. Um, there's another path uh, that the Eastern wisdom offers, and that is the path of mysticism. Uh, 
in the spirit of Paralimas, we, I think we should go beyond boundaries. It would be great if the two traditions come together to really unravel what truly nature is. Thank you. Agree. Agree. I make comment on that, just one comment. We are, as Paralimas, we just started a project on um, finding ways to navigate the east-west boundary, as we call it, which is the, the, the difference between the western rational thinking and the eastern, what we call mystical thinking. So the, the, the Paralimas indeed has taken up the challenge that you just mentioned. Almost all the research seems to have the paradigm of starting with something at a higher level and then reducing it within the organism back to a lower level. If we put this together with this morning's earlier talk, where the capability of the macaque monkey is a combination of internal structure and assimilated external structures, it suggests that the path of anything it understands has to go outside the organism. That's, that's a very interesting idea. Actually, with Atsushi, we are trying to, we, we plan something, well, not exactly alongside this line, but you, you are, your question is a challenge. A challenge, that is to say, what are the limits of the capac internal capacity of the human brain versus the monkey brain? Because if in the monkey brain, by changing the environment, you can boost the activity or the levels of the capacity, performance levels, then it means it's not inside, as you say, but it's outside or dependent upon the environment. But it would be very interesting to see what are the utmost boundaries, capacity boundaries of the chimpanzee, or um, in this case, marmoset brain, by changing in a more sophisticated way the, out uh, the outer environment. So your question in my reading is the following. How to define, with the help of manipulating the environment, the utmost internal capacity of a nervous system like the chimpanzee or, or monkey brain? And can we optimize and boost the capacity? And then coming back to the human brain, in this case, the question will be, if we change our environment with all these different possible devices, can we boost further the capacity of the human brain and can we, with the given biological endo endorsement, do tasks, perform tasks, which are, according to our recent knowledge, not possible? So your comment opened up, for me at least, some possibly experimental ideas. Thank you. So when we are talking about uh, emergence, um, these are actually natural emergence. Now, uh, our behavior or action, actions actually uh, leads to the dire direction of emergence as well. So don't you think that when we are actually trying to learn uh, how emergence happens or how a uh, system is emerging to a state, don't you actually uh, we bias the system to lead some to some uh, emerging state among different possibilities? Well, of course, the bias comes into each and every scientific exploration because that's the major law of, you can go back to Heisenberg or whatever. Um, when, you, when you probe the system, you always induce bias. And of course, it's a, it's a non-trivial philosophical and scientific issue how to, how to sort of um, clarify what is the bias and where is the system's behavior on its own. I don't know the answer, but that's definitely a major challenge. There was a question somewhere here earlier. Are there any more comments or questions? If not, let's thank Professor Goyash. And as a token of how we like this presentation, the, the Paralibas Institute would like to give him this.